So I've been introduced by Jason. Thank you very much for that. Thank you guys for being here. When I plan talks, I often have big aspirations and uh, I have a feeling like this is going to be the talk where I change lives. And uh, usually what ends up happening is a little less than what I was expecting, but uh, all this to say, I, I've done my best to prepare a presentation that sort of overlaps in something that is close to me and near and dear to me and, and just about me, and something that hopefully is re re relevant to you guys uh, also. So as a creative, I sort of ge naturally gear my talks around creative issues, and I, I, I just want to gauge a sense, like how many here are kind of in some kind of creative um, industries, like photography, design, writing, or even if you consider something that you're doing outside of like design, illustration, all that, and it's still creative. How many of you guys basically identify as creatives? Well, that's awesome. That's really awesome. Okay, then this talk is for you guys. Um, Hello. Yeah, so the, the sort of description of this talk on the uh, bill tonight was about kind of how I've taken, harnessed my influences and my inspiration in a way that's not imitative. And I, and I really think that, especially for creatives who are starting out, they, um, there's this spark of inspiration, a kind of it might be a dopamine rush where you, you love something and that kind of sets you off on this path for the rest of your life doing that thing. And, and then uh, right after you feel that feeling, you want to go and make something, probably just like what you saw because that's, that's what inspired you. But of course, as creatives, we want to sort of get to that point where we are not just imitating, we want to have some kind of a unique voice, a style, uh, something that's unique to us. And there's a big gap between that first moment of inspiration and that, that kind of part of your career or your creative life where, you're, where you're, you feel confident in that voice. And so that's, that's kind of what I'm going to talk about from my own experience, kind of the universals in the particular. So, I can talk to you about how I've been able to fill in that gap uh, a little bit, and uh, we'll be kind of going to far-reaching places, I think, that hopefully we'll come back all together uh, toward the end of this, of this talk. So I call myself an illustrator for simplicity's sake, but sometimes I actually prefer the term commercial artist because it's a little bit broader, and there's really no limit to what I do as an illustrator is no limit to the kind of surfaces, and I'll show you a bit of uh, you know the incarnations that my illustrations have taken. Um, I, I do kids' books. This one came out uh, in in May of 2018. I do magazines, magazine covers, uh, stories inside magazines. I also do uh, packaging. Did a collab with Fieldhouse a few years ago, which was really fun. I love I love any time my, my illustrations get to sort of end up on a on a actual three dimensional surface. I do a lot of lettering and and uh, not so much logos and branding, but in the case of something like Yahoo, uh, we team up every t every uh, few special occasions when there's a holiday or something, and they have me uh, do a kind of a hand lettered hand illustrated treatment of their logo. Uh, it ends up being about this big. And uh, no one really sees it, but um, if you ever look at Yahoo on your desktop, that's where it'll be the biggest. So next time there's a, a holiday, go to yahoo.com. It's usually the American one, and it's right there. So really exciting. I do print work, like prints, art prints. This was a poster I did for Polaris Music Prize. Uh, my illustrations end up in spaces, kind of. Uh, this was something uh, that was recently launched. It's at the airport in Vancouver. Uh, it's a kind of an ad campaign for commercial services. The people kind of run all the, the shops at the airport. I do a lot of maps. Uh, this map happened to end up as a mural in an office in Vancouver. And uh, so I'll, sh I'll be sharing a lot more of my work. Uh, I hope I didn't breeze through that too fast. In all my work, there's a sort of emerging style that comes out of it. I like to use the word voice, but style, style also works. And, and style is kind of like a mix between... 
uh, these physical qualities that you can see, like I like to use flat, bold shapes and simple colors and um, kind of like analog or physical looking textures. And, uh, and lately a lot of like people and characters have kind of shown up as part of my style. But then there's kind of intangible qualities. Kind of, for me, it's uh, things like silly humor. Um, it, it, I like to inject a sense of joy and um, someone recently described it as uh, my work as buoyant and lively, which I've really kind of latched on to. I think that really describes what I'm going for in my work. Uh, I like to have a bit of lightness to it. I think the world is full of dark and serious things. So I like to just bring fun to things that I do. And yeah, just overall have a, a sense of emotion in my work. I also have a lot of pointy, new, pointy noses and high-heeled boots for some reason show up. I've heard people often describe my style as retro, and these days it's not something I, I go for like specifically. I don't set out to make my things look like they're older, but I actually really embrace this, de this definition because I'm a huge fan of retro uh, stuff, specifically retro from like 1950s and 1960s, kind of between World War II and Vietnam when things were pretty chipper and happy and everybody seemed to be in a good mood, at least when you look at stuff from the day. Uh, everything seemed really positive and I, I love that, that look. I even like the kind of reproduction quality that you see in the, the commercial art of the day, um, the, the, the way that a vintage postcard looks like, uh, the way um, you see certain textures and, and overlapping of ink colors on, on paper that you don't really see today because we have such precise and high quality technology today. And so I, I've been really inspired by that. And so I'm going to share some of the artists and things that have inspired me and been an influence. And later on in the presentation, hopefully you'll be able to see how some of that inspiration has more or less overtly kind of shown up in my own work. So uh, uh, does anyone know Paul Rand? A few people, a few nods. Paul Rand, uh, you, you would see his uh, work today still in like... Uh, a good Chilliwack reference would be the Cummins logo that you see on like diesel pickups. Um, then you have IB the IBM logo. Uh, he designed the original UPS logo. And so really huge inf hugely influential. He's kind of billed as the, the one who brought the kind of European minimal modernism to American advertising. And uh, what I love is, he, uh, and what I, what I have been really influenced by Paul Rand for is that he's very all-encompassing. He's a designer, he's a graphic artist, uh, and that, that doesn't limit him just to logos and brands. He also do, d did a lot of illustration. His illustration style particular, particularly is very playful and kind of cut out -y, collage -y, using very simple shapes, very flat, and often kind of incorporating found textures. He also um, kind of almost looks like he just makes do with what he has. Uh, doesn't seem to, guy, to be a guy who has a lot of time. And I love uh, the sort of the whimsy that it seems like he made these with. I know that he was much more careful and thoughtful about what he made, but there's a sort of, um, what you see in his work is a kind of invitation to try it yourself. It's like, just cut these pieces out, put them on a paper, and just you know, use your own handwriting. And I've really embraced that a lot in my work, especially in the beginning, but still very much today. Another hugely influential uh, artist has been Miroslav Sasek. Has anyone um, seen these books before? A few, yeah. Um, really, like, nostalgic. You know, I didn't grow up, obviously, in the, in the time when these books were made for kids, like I wasn't a kid in the, the 60s. But um, you really get a sense of the, f the spirit of that era, or what it must have been like to be a traveler, looking at all the things that he saw and drew. Uh, and I, I just love the, the, his sense of design that he brings to his images. I f really feel like he captured that spirit of the era, and he does it really skillfully. Uh, his, his use of pattern and white space, a very sophisticated design sense to his, his artwork, even though he's a kid's book illustrator. I don't think I've ever seen kid's book illustrations as sophisticated as his. I particularly love how he kind of marries together realism and very kind of uh, one-to-one -one representation, like, you know, he'll draw a person like a person, but then he'll bring in abstraction, like, you know, here he, to represent a, the whole city of Paris, he just draws these abstract 
squares, kind of like pixels, and it just works. It's, it's beautiful, and I just love his textures. I love the, that you can see the strokes of his watercolor, that, that play between the drawing itself and the white space around the page. He, he has just like such a penchant for detail and the right kind of details. I love how he use like a solid color and then cut out a big white piece where the page shows through and use that as part of the image. Uh, I also like how he, um, his, his social commentary, the way he draws people is always kind of like a cheeky, playful way of depicting people. And particularly I love how he depicts maybe scenes of, of people in, in places he'd, he's, he'd never visited before. And you really capture that sense of that first impression of seeing people who are different than you and um, kind of capturing the best of that. I also love how he, um, yeah, just, I mean, his, his, the way he represents tourists, specifically in this book uh, about Venice, is, is quite playful and indicative of, of how he treats people in general. I'm sure more of us have seen The Hungry Caterpillar. This is a book that I would have, I, I definitely grew up with. Eric Carle's work, again, kind of like Rand's, it just invites you to try, try it. I mean, it, you can kind of see it, like he just found some textures and then cut them out in shapes and put them together, maybe drew some lines on it. Now, he's obviously more skilled than that, and he was the one who kind of made, popularized this style, so obviously he, he has that, that genius. But what I love about his work is it really invites you to try that yourself, and that's very much what I, I have done, especially early on, is, is, is this approach of finding textures or making textures and then kind of cutting them out in playful ways. Right, so Ben Sean, uh, what I love about Ben Sean is that his use of simple black line to create a really graphic effect. He, he's also a paint, he was also a painter, he was an activist, uh, a photographer, so a lot of his work was actually more painterly and full. But I'm particularly drawn to his use of, of line uh, and, and just these simple, kind of complex and busy and simple at the same time kind of compositions. Another thing that I've been really influenced by Ben Sean is his uh, he kind of had like a house, uh, like a personal style of doing lettering that was very consistent across a lot of his, a lot of his work. And I really borrowed that from him, that idea of having a lettering style that's kind of your style, and you can use it for anything, a, a poster about almost any topic, and it kind of is your, it, it like connects the work to you, and, and it somehow adds to the piece because it's not just like a, a conventional font. Charlie Harper? Does anyone know Charlie Harper's work? So I feel like there was a bit of a Charlie Harper craze a few years ago, but um, he's known as kind of like a minimal realist, I think is the term I've heard. And so he'll, he'll use these very reductive forms, but then add these lines and, and textures to his forms that really give it life. So he can do a lot with so little, and, and I love that minimalism and the kind of joy and character he brings to his his pieces. Particularly for him, uh, something that I've really taken into my own work is this idea of um, making a shape that's kind of stylized. It represents the object, but it's not exactly shaped like you'd see it in real life, like this collie, for instance. The, the collie is obviously in real life a little differently shaped, but you, you get that. You get that it's, it's, it's a collie just by the way he's been able to reduce it to these, these shapes. And then kind of combining or, or confining these t brushy textures inside of that and using very simple lines to add movement and, and define the form a bit. So next uh, artists that I've been influenced by are the Provinsons. I feel like Alice and Martin Provinsons' work is like quintessentially of the era that I, that I love, quintessentially mid-century. And uh, you, here you get that, those beautiful kind of solid blocks of color, but it's also very textured. You get this sense of, of the, the paper texture and the, and the way the, 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 the color kind of interacts with the page. And then they also use white space to sort of cut out of that and define form. And you have, I really love the way they're reductive with their background uh, objects, like in this case, the, the, the buildings in the background. They're, they're very simple. There's not a lot to them. And you don't need to draw a very detailed house to, to represent that object. And I, I've really embraced this. I mean, one thing, one thing that might be apparent in my work is that I, I'm not realistic. I'm not very heavily detailed most of the time. And I don't want to be. It's, it's, I've never been drawn to making very detailed, say, comic books. Like, I can't even read comic books because 
there's too many things on one page. And that's just like, um, I, I like things that are much more graphic and simple. Uh, I'm also kind of m drawn more toward abstraction than realism. So while I, I have tried my hand a little bit at realistic drawing and, and, and you know, being a good drawer, uh, that, that kind of thing just isn't like my, my favorite. So I'm, I'm drawn to work that kind of has that more like, oh, you can, you can kind of just depict these things in a really interesting way, but also really simply. It's not to say that you, it's not a lot of work to do it. It's not like, um, it's not just a matter of laziness. There's a sort of, there's a sort of um, art to it. And that, that's the thing that I'm most curious about. It's like, how do they do it so simply, but so well? Uh, the last couple images from the Provinces. You can see how they had that very childish style in the previous page, and then they, they still have this same kind of feeling in their work, but in a much more grown-up set of images here. These are from a book about myths and legends. Amazing use of color. So apart from the artists that I've been inspired by, I've also just been inspired by everyday objects and ephemera, uh, kind of from that era. I'm a collector, and I don't collect meaningful, valuable things. I seem to collect like stuff that are in the free boxes at the end of a garage sale on the curb. And I mean, that asbestos uh, ashtray is one such thing. Uh, got it across the street from me and I love it. I think, I think it's just so cool. Like there's, n there's probably very few of those around in the world and the, the way the lettering is done is, is obviously by, by hand, it's not a font. And again, there's that reproduction quality that, that I kind of talked about before where you have, like, if, like for instance, in the, um, the box of flash bulbs on the bottom that says Optina on it, you have basically blue and orange, and then they've used that blue overlapping the orange, and you get this kind of darker blackish color. And that's just what they had to work with, limited inks. Uh, they had to work fast. They had to um, make it work with the technology of the day. It's, it's just, uh, I feel like in a way they had an advantage over us by having these constraints and having to think creatively to work with, uh, on time, on budget. And, and don't forget, all these things were made by hand. Somebody had to like cut out the shape of that light bulb. Uh, no, nobody had a computer. I mean, even the communication between the person making it and the client, there's no email. So all this took a lot of time, so they had to work fast and find ways of working fast. And I really think that played a lot into the uh, aesthetic of and the, this reproduction quality I, I speak of. So uh, those are the artists that I and the, th the things, the objects that I, I've really been inspired by. And uh, now I'm gonna show you kind of a timeline of, of my work. I, I struggled with this because over the course of, what has it been, 2006, I, I can't do the math right now, maybe 15, 14, 13 years, something like that. There's, there's so many things you make in there. A, a, a lot of it, 50%, maybe 80% of it is stuff that I wouldn't wanna show anyone and just kind of picking out uh, the, these projects is a little bit hard, but what I've tried to do is take um, ones that kind of show this progression from being more imitative of, my, of the, the, the artists that I admire and, and then gradually uh, going more towards something a little bit more original. So 2006, first year in art school, and we had to do this project in my, my first, uh, like my foundation art class, it was about like color theory. And so right away I was like, oh, I'm gonna make a book like Eric Carle. And so that's what I did. I painted these textures using gouache and then I kind of, I knew how to use Photoshop. So instead of cutting these out by hand and pasting them on paper, I kind of just borrowed the idea of what he did and, and, and did the cutouts in Photoshop. Um, fast forward a few years, I was, uh, a lot happened. Uh, in art school that I won't show because what happens in art school should stay in art school. But um, I was lucky enough toward the end of my uh, time there to get an internship with a pretty cool design studio. And they put me on right away. They trusted me to do an illustration for a local college magazine, which was really cool. Uh, so right away, I was like, Paul Rand. Uh, based on kind of the art direction they gave me. And so here you can kind of see, if you think back to those, those images of the book covers by Paul Rand, inc incorporating like your handwriting and, and kind of looks like it was kind of cut out in a hurry. I kind of went for that and it, it, I, it kind of worked. Charlie Harper 
was a big influence on this one. So I graduated, moved to Vancouver, got a job as, as, a, as a designer, art director. And one of the things that uh, we, we had to do when we made magazines was source stock photography or hire a photographer or an illustrator. The idea of hiring an illustrator was very foreign to us. And, and so if we wanted illustration, we had to make it. And, and so all the, I, I decided that for most things that I made, we absolutely needed to have illustration because I wanted to illustrate for it. And so uh, this was a case where I, I was kind of really heavily influenced by Charlie Harper, kind of making something that represents, a, you know, an, an animal in this case, but in a very kind of abstracted kind of way, containing these wild chaotic textures in this very con constrained kind of shape, and then adding some, some, some uh, very precise lines over top just to make that that form and, and really give it a, a lion, a sense of being a lion in this case. So these, these guys, um, you might see these at Costco or Superstore. They're still kicking around. This, these I did while I was at uh, an agency in North Van. And they th these were apple chips, obviously, and, and they wanted to kind of evoke the sense of flavor. And I was like, OK, got to have illustration here. So I, I kind of summoned my Eric Carl inspiration and just made these kind of washy textures and, and, and threw them into an apple. I mean, it, you can see how it was made, which is why I like that style. I, I really like a style that sort of betrays itself, uh, makes it look deceptively simple. And I also was able to incorporate some of my hand lettering of this one. Okay, so at a certain point, uh, around 2013, I decided I was done being a, a, a designer in the, in the kind of advertising agency world. I wanted to uh, venture out and be, go freelance with the hopes of eventually becoming a full-time illustrator. And uh, the first thing I did to kind of kick things off was create a set of business cards. And this was really like the, 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 the tone that I wanted to set. And it's this kind of still very distinctly retro looking, I'd say. Um, I used a, a very retro way of reproducing these using a letterpress, which basically like uh, you can use limited colors and they kind of get stamped down on a page. And, and uh, it's, it's um, a very limiting and constrained way of uh, reproducing things. That's what I kicked off with. This was 2013. Uh, kind of stuck with this style through 2014, 2015. Kind of kept using this in different contexts and I was able to enjoy using it uh, uh, for some pretty f great clients. But um, I started finding myself limited with that style because when people would, I, I basically avoided drawing people and uh, because I felt like the people I drew in that style were it was just really, there's something restrictive about it. I couldn't quite figure it out. And I also just wanted to develop a style that was um, more versatile in other ways. I could, I could make it more complex, less white space in the background, more, more uh, involved scenes, more overlapping, and less, less sort of referring to these older processes where it was simpler and embracing a bit more of the digital tools that I had uh, um, the opportunity to use. So here you see me kind of getting tighter with my overall shapes, um, being a little bit more precise, but still allowing the textures within them to be a little bit wild and chaotic. And, and that's always been a, a, a component of my style is this, this um, sort of merging of chaos and order. So you have these chaotic shapes, but they're always kind of bound within, or I should say these chaotic textures, and they're bound within these kind of more buttoned down shapes. 2017, kind of still this progression, you start seeing almost exclusively character-driven illustrations. So kind of flicking that, that switch from like, I'm going to start embracing these tools and becoming more versatile. I get this light bulb go off. That I actually really enjoy drawing people, and, and it's actually hard not to include them in my illustrations now. Um, last year, I started getting a little bit restless and um, experimental. And I, I was approached by a, a developer in Vancouver to make some, some posters that would hang on their wall in this big gallery in one of their showrooms. And, and uh, I was like, are you sure you want me to do these? Because they gave me these like, references that were really architectural, really like vector-based drawings. And I didn't really see myself in them. So I, I said, you know, just so you know, like, I, I'm, I don't know what, what I'm going to make for you. I don't know what it's going to look like. And if you're OK with that, then let's do this. And, and so they were like, we want you to do it, Tom. And so I just I took that as permission to be really experimental and a little bit jazzy and really uh, pushed the limits of this, these techniques and processes that I'd, I'd kind of 
been evolving and developing since I started as an illustrator way back. These particular pieces involve not just these inky textures and things that I make. Um, I probably left out this part where a part, big part of how I make those textures is I, I actually make those by hand using black ink and I scan them in and then I just kind of work them into the illustration. I don't really like Photoshop brushes because they often look like Photoshop brushes, even the best ones by Kyle Webster. Um, they, there's a sort of like template-y look to them or something. You kind of, if, if you know what the tools are, you know that they're digital. And so I've always shied away from using digital uh, brushes particularly. So a lot of the, the like textures in here you see are, are just scanned, sampled things that I actually made in, in uh, physical space. But there's also, I started bringing in some digital brushes and hopefully you can't really tell which are which. So I'm getting better at using new tools in old ways or to look uh, not, not so obvious. I don't want them to betray that they were made digitally. This was also made late last year. This is just an indication of, of us, uh, I guess, one of my commercial styles where it's, it's very clean and fun and bright and colorful. And uh, these are made almost purely digitally. And uh, this year has been I've, been, I've continued my trajectory of just like really being uh, experimental and, and letting my inspiration and those, those, that drive to be specifically retro or whatever it was at the beginning, really just letting go of that, not really aiming for that, and just being a little bit more bold in, in, in how I approach these. So these are made almost, uh, using the same kind of techniques that I, I've always used, but just like pushing a bit, like here I'm going for a little bit more realism, a little bit less abstraction. Incorporating more ha hand lettering is, is showing up more and more in my work, kind of like what I see in Ben Sean, but uh, in my own way. Um, yeah, so I feel like, yes, I'm an illustrator and these are illustrations and not all of us are, are aiming or to be illustrations and, and not all of us are even at the beginning of our creative career. And, but I, I do think that, especially if you are beginning, uh, this is relevant, but even within, within a given project, these three stages kind of exist. And this is a pattern that I've seen, is you start off being inspired by something. You start off with that dopamine rush of, I love that, that is so cool. How do I touch that in my own work? Um, and so I think we all have to start there. That middle part does involve imitation. So nobody wants to be a duplicate of another artist. Nobody wants to rip another artist off. And especially in today's kind of call-out culture, you'll be called out <laughs> really quickly if someone sees that you've copied, right? And, but I do think there is this need and permission. I, I think you should have permission to emulate and imitate, especially to learn. Look under the hood, deconstruct, take apart, but go beyond that. You know, while, while you're imitating, find out how they did it. Find out about the artist. Find out about the, their influences. Find out about their processes. You want to kind of find out what inspires you about that piece and then find out how to get that into your own work. And hopefully it's, it's not just the, the reproduction quality or just the, the, the superficial style. There's a spirit in it that you're trying to tap into. So the third stage of, of that, that journey, that creative journey that we have in our lives and even within a, a project is, is evolution. So you, you've imitated, you've emulated, you've picked apart, you've deconstructed. Now it's time to sort of use what you've learned and apply, apply it to new situations and apply your own more personality into it. And so here's an example of how I would actually work that out in, a, in each project. So at the beginning of a project, I obviously don't have a vision for what I'm gonna do. If I did, my job would be very easy. I, I can't, see what I'm, I, I just have no idea what's gonna happen. So I need to have some kind of inspiration. So what I do is I'll, like, let's just say I need to draw a scene of people lining up at a bus stop. You know, that, that sounds pretty dry, but 
what I'll do is I'll just get an image, like I'll go online and just look at images of people at a bus stop, and I'll just start drawing them. And I have no goal of actually making an illustration from these drawings. I'm just copying what I see. And by doing that, I'm kind of internalizing it. Uh, I'm kind of downloading information about it. And, and then at a certain point, I have to put that, those pictures away. And that's when the real sketching happens. I put the, the, the references away. I don't look at them anymore. I have enough information. And, and that I, I need to combine with my own experience, my own, um, my own memory, my own lack of memory, my skills, my lack of skills. All that goes into my, my work. And so I'll start sketching from that. And it's, it's sort of like you might remember parts. I might remember partly what I drew, but there's going to be big gaps. Of, of things that I forgot. And it's kind of in those gaps and how I make up for it that end up being my style and my contribution. And, and it doesn't take a lot of effort not to imitate because I've, I've kind of internalized what I love, or, or in this case, it's not necessarily what I love, but something I need to be inspired by, which is you know, images of people lining up for buses. Uh, very inspiring stuff. But the idea is that there's this, this process of learning and copying and then you have to put it away. And so I say, love it, look at it, then leave it alone. And, and that's kind of, if, if you want to grow past just emulating and imitating, that's kind of what you have to do. You kind of have to love it, imitate it, look at it, and then leave it alone. And, and so in your evolution, you're constantly doing that. You're constantly applying your new experience, your new perspectives, things that are current to you today, uh, using all the things that you've learned up up to that point. So I kind of have this uh, training wheels analogy, if I haven't driven my point hard enough. Um, basically, when we're inspired, that inspiration is our training wheels, right? But our goal is to get off those training wheels and, and ride two, on two wheels all by yourself, right? And that's, that's, being ori that's originality and that's having your style. Now, the gap, the middle, is that first part when you have to take those training wheels off. And you don't know if you're going to be able to stay on two wheels. And it, you're in a very vulnerable state when you're starting to emerge and craft your own voice because you're putting you there. You're not hiding behind someone else's style. So once your parent lets go of the seat and, ooh, good effect. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, so once, once uh, you let go, you might, you might fail, but you might not. But once you get going, that's kind of just the beginning of your story. Uh, that's, that's like, then who knows how, you know, where biking will take you, the places you'll go, and the sort of kind of, you know, maybe you'll be a, a really good mountain biker, or maybe you'll be a very fast road biker. You know, I'm really stretching the metaphor here, but all I'm saying is good luck. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs>